For many centuries it was believed that living organisms were created just as we see them today. This means that from the time they were created, they have remained unchanged. There is very little evidence to support this hypothesis. The alternate view is that all living things as we see them today have arisen or evolved from a distant common ancestor. Such an evolution is due to a process of gradual change. The vital question is, what is the mechanism by which the evolutionary process or the process which is described as descent with modification takes place? About 130 years ago, Charles Robert Darwin, by way of answering these questions, proposed the theory of natural selection. 29th of November, 1859, is an important date in the history of biology. It was the day that Darwin's great book, The Origin of Species, was published. The book was the result of over 20 years of work, which included Darwin's keen observations, interpretations, conversations and discussions with a number of naturalists, breeders and gardeners, correspondence with biologists at home and abroad, and a voyage that took him across the Pacific to Australia and then to Africa before returning to England. The book was the first one to propose a possible reason for evolution and the first one to provide significant array of evidence that evolution has occurred. To explain his theory of evolution, Darwin brought in many kinds of information. Information from heredity and variation, fossils, geological formations, geographical distribution, embryology, taxonomy and homology. The evidence he thus obtained from various sources provided the answer to the all important question. How did evolution occur? Darwin answered it occurs through natural selection acting on heritable variations. But what is natural selection? And how is it an instrument contributing to the evolutionary process? The theory of evolution as proposed by Darwin states that all plants and animals reproduce far in excess of the numbers that actually survive and that there is a struggle for survival. The fact that there are variations among members of the species and that some of these variations are more advantageous than the others decides which of the organisms should survive. It is in this context Herbert Spencer's phrase survival of the fittest is used to interpret Darwinism. In other words, organisms which are less fit or less well adapted will be eliminated either by the biotic or the abiotic environment. Naturally, this process of elimination of unfit individuals from the environment would result in the survival of organisms with better adaptations. Let us now elaborate the Darwinian facts and deductions a little. There is a tendency in nature for the organisms to overproduce. A codfish produces 10 million eggs in a season. An oyster may produce over 100 million eggs per spawning. A roundworm, an intestinal parasite, produces 700,000 eggs in just 24 hours. But not all of them survive. And the situation would be unimaginable if these numbers would survive 
and reproduce again. Darwin himself gave an example of the slowest breathing organism, the elephant. Assuming a longevity of 100 years for an elephant and an active breeding period of 60 years in it, a single female can give birth to six calves. If all of them survive and reproduce at the same rate, Darwin calculated, then in about 750 years, a simple pair could have left behind 19 million descendants. Obviously, such large number of organisms do not exist. This is because most do not survive. This struggle or competition may take several forms. The struggle for food and territory, the struggle to overcome adverse climatic conditions, such as cold or drought, and the struggle to escape the predators. Such a struggle keeps the adult population numbers more or less constant. Who survives the struggle? It is evident to all of us that variations among organisms are universal. With the exception of monozygotic twins, no two individuals of a given species are similar. And in many cases, the differences can be quantified. Many of these variations may be neutral or may not confer any advantage on the organism. But many other variations do influence the chances of survival of the organism in which they are present. A rabbit with thicker fur on its body may survive the winter more easily than the ones which possess less fur. A desert plant with right mechanisms for water conservation will survive better than others which do not have such mechanisms. An animal that has developed speed would escape predation efficiently and a predator with well-developed sense organs can spot the prey easily. Such examples of demonstration of variations are numerous in nature. The outcome of such a struggle for existence is what Darwin called natural selection. There are several instances to demonstrate the action of natural selection. In natural populations, they are illustrative of the fact that selection is a continuous and ongoing process. Two such examples relate to industrial melanism in peppered moth and sickle cell anemia in man. A classic example that has been well documented in wild populations is that of peppered moths. In 19th century England, people collected moths and butterflies. The collectors eagerly sought after the rare specimens of peppered moths, distant vetilaria, which were almost black in color. These dark forms are known as melanics. The other variety of Biston betularia, the grey non-melanics, were found in plenty. By looking at moth collections made in hundred years, biologists found that the black forms became more and more common between 1850 and 1950, and the grey non-melanics became more and more scarce, more so near the industrial areas. What could be the possible reason for the increase in the number of melanics and decrease of non-melanics in a span of hundred years. Moths being nocturnal, fly, feed and mate at night. During the day, they rest on the tree trunks and similar surfaces. They remain camouflaged and protected from predators. Before England became an industrialized country, the mottled grey forms were well camouflaged, resting on the lichen-covered tree trunks. Contrarily, the black forms resting on these trees were easily picked up and eaten by the predating birds. This explained why the melanics were rare prior to industrialization. With the onset of industrial revolution, there was a change in the situation. The smoke emanating from the factories contributed to pollution and in turn to the blackening of the tree trunks. On such trees, the mottled grey forms stood out in contrast to the background. The grey forms were eaten by predators in much greater numbers. The evolution of darker forms of the insect in response to industrial pollution 
is known as industrial melanism. The phenomenon was investigated in detail by Bernard Kettlewell of the Oxford University. Kettlewell raised in his laboratory large numbers of melanic and non-melanic forms. He marked these moths and released equal numbers of them in two areas, one an unpolluted rural area and another a polluted industrial area. The marked moths were recaptured after a specified period of time. The results were interesting. The percentage of melanics recaptured in the industrial area were twice that of non-melanics. Similarly, only half the number of black moths were recaptured in the unpolluted countryside as compared to the grey forms. The experiment of Kettlewell provided credence to the hypothesis that black melanics would survive in industrial areas and grey non-melanics in rural areas. What does this experiment go to show? In polluted areas, a large number of black forms live longer to reproduce more of their kind. The color of the moth is a trait that is inherited. Therefore, subsequent generations will have more black moths than the previous generation. In short, the frequency of gene for black color increases in population with time, and that is evolution. Darwin's son, Major Leonard Darwin, once told E.B. Ford of the Oxford University that his father expressed the hope that it must be possible to observe the action of natural selection and the resultant evolutionary change within the lifespan of an individual. Industrial melanism is an example where Darwin's prophetic hope came true in a matter of a few decades. The natural selection has been shown to act at molecular level also. This relates to the oxygen-carrying protein hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a tetramer formed of two alpha and two beta chains. A small change in the structure of the protein results in a fatal disease, the sickle cell anemia. Most people suffering from this disease die before reaching adulthood. The disease first appeared in equatorial Africa, slowly spread to parts of the Arabian Peninsula, to the southern area, and finally to North America. You know, hemoglobin carries oxygen from the lungs, where its tension is high, and releases in its tissues, where its tension is low. In people suffering from the disease, when the oxygen tension is reduced in deoxygenated stage, the molecule undergoes polymerization. This results in the formation of long fibers which cause red blood cells to assume a sickle-like shape. Why does this polymerization occur? Proteins are composed of amino acids. The normal beta chain of hemoglobin has the amino acid, the glutamic acid, in the sixth place. In sickle cell anemia patient, the sixth place in the polymerized chain is occupied by another amino acid, the valine. Here is an incidence of how a small change in the structure of the protein can cause a big change in its functioning. Let us now look into the genetics of the disease. Normal beta chain is coded by a gene HBA. The gene for normal beta chains has an adenine nucleotide in the sixth codon, which is replaced by thymine nucleotide in the abnormal chains. It is this substitution of nucleotide in the gene that results in the substitution of the amino acid in the sixth position of the beta chain. Each gene has two alleles that are located on the two homologous chromosomes. Thus, the normal individuals have homozygous genotype HBA, HBA for the beta chain of hemoglobin. The anemia is due to homozygous genotype for the sickle cell allele HBS. Most HBS, HBS homozygotes die early in their life. In spite of this fact, the frequency of HBS alleles is quite high in certain regions of the world. 
Why is it so? Why should the selection process maintain an allele that is fatal in homozygous conditions in large numbers in certain populations? Studies have gone to show that in those regions of the world where malaria is common, the incidence of allele is also common. It was found that people who are heterozygotes, HPA, HPS, are resistant to malarial infections, whereas normal homozygotes, HPA, HPA, are not. More particularly in African and Asian populations where malaria is rife, heterozygotes, HPA, HPS, individuals enjoy selective advantage over both homozygotes. Whereas normal homozygous HPA, HPA individuals have to fear malaria, HPS, HPS individuals, the sickle cell disease. The HPA, HPS individuals are protected from both malaria and the sickle cell disease, although due to the presence of sickle cell allele, there is bound to be some sickling of cells in their blood. A more interesting case of protection against the sickle cell disease has come to light in recent years in Saudi Arabia. Whereas human adult hemoglobin has two alpha and two beta chains, human embryos and fetus have a different composition in their hemoglobins. Human embryonic hemoglobin has two alpha and two epsilon chains. Once the embryo becomes a fetus, the hemoglobin has two alpha and two gamma chains. Only at the time of birth, the switchover from gamma to beta chains occur. Saudi Arabians who are homozygous for HPS allele continue to produce fetal hemoglobin in their adult life as well. HPF constitutes nearly 10 to 25 percent of the hemoglobin. It is known that fetal hemoglobin does not copolymerize with sickle cell hemoglobin. This results in the dissolution of the sickle cell hemoglobin and thus inhibits the sickling process. Here again, natural selection favors the presence of an allele, namely the allele for fetal hemoglobin in individuals who under normal circumstances do not possess it, thereby ensuring their survival. The two examples are illustrative of the fact that natural selection promotes alleles of the traits that are better adapted to a given environment. In other words, genes for these adaptations spread in population and their frequencies increase. The population as a whole is better adapted. Was not Darwin absolutely right when he said that evolution is a simple fact of life? Thank you.